If you have an ancestor who came through the port of New York sometime between the late 19th century and the early 20th century, then the Ellis Island search portal at statueofliberty.org is definitely for you and your genealogy research. Here to tell us more about the website is Catherine Marks. She's the manager of the Family History Center at Ellis Island. Welcome to the show, Catherine. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. So let's start by talking about what our goal is, our goal in finding passenger lists at the passenger search website. Uh, tell us a little bit about what passenger lists are and why they are so valuable to genealogists. Sure. So the goal of the Ellis Island database is to find passenger lists, as you mentioned. Um, the passenger lists that we have, they're for the Port of New York, um, and they span from 1820 to 1957. Um, for those who don't know, a passenger list basically documents a person's arrival to the United States from foreign ports. Um, these records are valuable to genealogists because they can tell the story of your ancestor's arrival to the United States. They may provide information about one's nationality and place of birth, um, the ship name, the date of entry to the United States. You can find their age, height, eye and hair color. Um, their occupation will be listed, their last place of residence. You'll even find the name and address of the relatives that they're joining in the United States, um, even the amount of money that they were carrying on them. So if you're familiar with passenger lists, you'll notice that they actually look different over the years. Um, these passenger lists, they changed to follow the immigration laws of the time. Um, after 1907, manifest changed from having one page of information to becoming a two-page document. Um, and they asked roughly 30 questions on these two-page manifests. Um, so if you're searching for records on our website, be sure to look for that second page. A lot of people don't even realize that it exists and it's a whole second page of information. But we actually, we have more than just passenger records in our database as well. You can also find the crew manifests um, if you have an ancestor who might have worked on board the ship. Um, we also have detention records and we have records for special inquiry. Um, so to figure out if your ancestor may have been detained, you have to find the manifest record first. And then if you look to the left of their name on the record itself, if you see an X or a handwritten SI, which means special inquiry, they were probably held here on Ellis Island for one reason or another. The detention records that we have in our database will actually tell you why your ancestor may have been detained. Uh, perhaps they were sick um, and held in the hospital. Maybe they didn't have enough money and were listed as LPC, which means likely to become a public charge. You can even use these records to figure out how many days they were detained by counting the number of meals they ate while they were here. Um, unfortunately, the detention records and the records for special inquiry are not indexed. So to find them, you have to find your ancestor's manifest first, and then you use the carousel of images to manually scroll through the microfilm to either the beginning or the end of that ship to find these records. Right. Oh, wow. Okay. So there's so much more than just the list. And I totally agree with you. That second page is just as good as the first. Yeah. So we don't want to miss that. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, and you mentioned, you know, that your records actually now go much earlier. T can you they just do. help us clarify a little bit? You know, I think of Ellis Island and when it was called that and operated as such, but it's really the port of New York. Can you help us yes. understand that a little better? Sure. So um, the records, as I said, they span from 1820 to 1957. Um, the pre-Ellis records, we call them also the Castle Garden records. Um, they start in about 1820 and then they go up to 1892 when Ellis Island actually opened. Um, before Ellis Island opened, immigration was state run. So Castle Garden was the state run immigration station. And then when the federal government took over the process of immigration, that was when they built Ellis Island in 1892. So actually when you're looking at the records from the 1800s, they're not actually manifest, they're customs lists. Um, and a lot of people don't know that, um, which is why they're so basic. Um, if you look at these records, usually you'll just see 
your ancestor's name, it'll have their age, um, sometimes an occupation, and then it'll say the country that they were coming from going to the United States. So they don't have as much information as the records from the peak Ellis Island years. Um, and the reason the manifests don't exist from the 1800s is because they actually burned in a fire that was on Ellis Island in 1897. So anything pre-1897 that you're looking at, it's actually going to be a customs record. Then the peak years, they go from 1892 to 1924. Um, by 1924, Ellis Island's function changed. It became more a place of um, detention and deportation. So most people wouldn't have stepped foot on Ellis Island unless they were be being detained for some reason. Um, and then even though Ellis Island officially closed its doors in 1954, our records go up until 1957. They were actually written at the port of departure and then the inspectors here at Ellis Island would take those manifest records into the um, inspection room and they would ask the immigrants the same questions to make sure they answered them in the same way. We have several options uh, on the search page at the website, um, and it's heritage.statueofliberty.org slash passenger. We'll have the list in our show notes, so folks can go straight to that passenger search page. Um, we have several options there, so what's the best approach when we're beginning our search for passenger lists? When you're beginning your search, um, the first thing that you have to do is you have to type your ancestor's name into the search bar. Um, and then you can actually choose um, from different wildcard searches to find different name variations. Um, we recommend using close matches and sounds like. Um, also alternative spellings can be really helpful if you're unsure about the spelling of the name or if their name is spelled incorrectly in the database. Um, if you're getting too many results, you can narrow the search by using filters. Um, to get into the filters from that main search page, you can either click on the wizard or the one page form. Um, I prefer to use the one page form because then you can view all the different filters on one page instead of having to scroll through the different options. Um, and the best parameters to use would be the age at arrival, um, year of arrival, if you know that information, port of departure um, or country of origin. Um, but we recommend that even when specifying the age at arrival or year of arrival, you should leave a couple years in each direction. Um, even if you have a specific year of immigration, it's always good to leave some wiggle room just in case there's errors in the record. Um, if you're searching for records outside of the peak Ellis years, which again are 1892 to 1924, we recommend to not use the filters. Um, the records after 1924 were actually added after the original website launched and they're indexed differently than the original set of records. So many of the passenger lists, they're actually only indexed by the year of arrival um, and they're given a placeholder date of January 1st. So if you try to search for a specific month and a day of arrival, you won't get any results. Wow, that's great to know. Okay. And so if we do our initial search, uh, and you mentioned the one page form is a, is a great way to go, um, but we don't come up with something that we think is a match. Any suggestions on kind of which direction should you go? We shouldn't just give up there, should we? No, you definitely should not give up. Um, I think the best approach to take when beginning the search is to start really broad, even if you have a lot of information about your ancestor's arrival. Um, the key in the search is that you have to use your ancestor's original ethnic name. Um, as we already mentioned before, the names were recorded at the port of departure before they were ever changed. So it's really important to determine the ethnic equivalent for their name in the immigrant's native language. Um, and just as an example, um, the English name George might be listed as Giorgio if he's Italian, it could be Georgi if he's Hungarian. Jorgen if he's German, or Juraj if he's Croatian. Um, if you're unsure about the ethnic equivalent of your ancestor's name, you can actually try to search by using the first initial of their name um, with, and use the contains filter. In many cases, but not all, 
um, the first initial will be the same across different languages. So that's why we recommend to do that. Well, that really makes a difference then to know the history of the creation of the records, the fact that they're being done right. in a sense in the old country, and that we have to keep that yes. in mind as we're working with it. Um, any other tips or strategies or any other place on the website where we can get a little bit of extra help if we need some help? On the website, we do have um, a tips and tricks section. So if you are hitting roadblocks, you can use that. Um, don't give up. Usually, if you're not finding it right away, it has something to do with the spelling of the name. And sometimes it can take a lot of digging to find a passenger. Um, like I said before, make sure to use different variations of your ancestor's name in case it was spelled incorrectly um, or even mistranscribed. Um, a lot of times the clerk may have recorded the name as he heard it. So you can also try searching for the phonetic spellings of the name as well. Mm. Um, and then if you're familiar with these records, many of them are handwritten. So it's also possible that they're transcribed incorrectly in the database just simply due to human error. Um, if you've exhausted all possibilities using our database, you may wanna consider whether your ancestor arrived at a different port of entry Many people think New York was the only port of entry for immigrants, but that's not true. Um, there were other ports along the East Coast, including Philadelphia, Boston, or Baltimore. Um, and many of those passenger lists are digitized and they're also available online. Um, for specific tips and strategies, um, Keep in mind that Italian women usually travel with their maiden name even after they get married. Um, if they're traveling with children, those children can either be listed with the mother's maiden name or the father's name, so you can try both. Um, if you're looking for a Jewish ancestor, their ethnicity is going to be listed as Hebrew, and they will probably tr be traveling with their Yiddish name. So figuring out the Yiddish name is really important to finding the correct passenger. Um, if you're searching for a family group and having trouble finding a family, um, families will all be listed together on a manifest. So if you find one person from that family, you can find them all traveling together. So usually we recommend um, to try searching for the kids. There were less children traveling, so a lot of times they're easier to find. And then some tips for the, the pre-LS records. Um, a lot of times on those earlier records, the names are abbreviated. So um, the first name William might be listed as WM. Um, and then something else to consider is that women might be listed under their husband's name. So instead of being Mary Smith, they might be Mrs. Smith. So you have to consider all of these things in your search. Boy, those are great strategies. Good, and and that comes from you know your working knowledge of ha working with these records all the time and having seen this. It helps us kind of know what to right. look for. Uh, wonderful! It is a fantastic sure. website. Um, anything else going on new at Ellis Island, or anything that you'd like to share with us and uh, tell our listeners about? Um, well, we're planning to expand to all of the ports. So eventually. Um, the hope is that you will be able to find your ancestors even if they did not arrive through Ellis Island. Um, we'll have access to those other ports of entry as well. So hopefully in the near future, we'll have those records included in our database. Oh, that is exciting. Oh my goodness. Particularly, as you said, sometimes we think it was New York, but really it wasn't. It could have been Philadelphia or somewhere else. Right. So fantastic. Yes. Well, I hope you stay in touch with us and uh, keep us up to yeah, date on those efforts. Uh, Catherine, thank you so much for taking us kind of on a, a tour of the passenger list search at Ellis Island. We appreciate it. Thank you so much.